The first time I faced uncertainty was when I was a kid. I basically missed the bus. I was six years old, mind you. And this was really a big problem because I had to go home. I had to eat, I had homework to do, and I had stuff to do. And now it's like, as a six-year-old, this is really a big problem. So I thought to myself, I panicked. I was wondering, wait, perhaps I could walk back. But I've never done that before. I've never done that before. I've never walked back before. I was filled with brimming with excitement. It's like a quest, a journey, so to speak, as though I wanted to do a journey to go home. But then, slowly, that excitement kind of faded for something else. I've never done that before. I started to become scared because, well, I've never done that before. <laughs> but being a kid, I went on anyway. So it was hard. The sun was really, really hot, and it was this big road I had to cross. Mind you, there wasn't a zebra crossing back then. So when I arrived home, I was really happy. I called my parents immediately, and I told them, it's like, I walked home from school. Yes. And then to that, I got a response. Why did you do that? Are you crazy? You could have gotten kidnapped. You could have gotten lost. All those bad things could have happened. And la, 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 and on and on and on they went. But to me, all I was thinking was, hey, I walked back from school, and I could travel so far. Previously, all I knew was just my home and my school. But now I started to ask myself, perhaps if my legs can take me so far, how far would my bicycle bring me? I could explore the new neighborhoods next door. I could cycle up that hill to visit the shops up there. I could go down to the valley and visit the villages. Suddenly, my world has expanded. Fast forward to the future. I was about to graduate from university. And as most graduates would have to do, they would have to find a job. I was in the office with my professor, and he asked me, hey, Tim, would you like to work for me as a research assistant? To which I said, yes. Research is what I've always wanted to do. So I asked him, then, what would you like me to research on? And so he told me, I would like you to build the world's fastest robotic fish. And again, that same excitement filled me, because I'm going to build a robotic fish. I mean, I've built robots before, but they're nothing on that scale. I've built like little tiny robots that roll around the floor. Simple thing, but this is a robotic fish. But with that same excitement, slowly there comes that little dump again. But I've never done it before. What happens if it doesn't work out? And anyway, I started on the work. Being extremely eager, I dive right in. In fact, I mean, who wouldn't be excited? I'm building a world's fastest robotic fish. Think about it. Imagine I could build a fish that was faster than the fastest human swimmer. Like, take that, Michael Phelps. Or I could build a fish that was faster than any ship. And take that, all engineers. Or even to stretch the imagination a little further, I could build a fish that could literally jump out of the water, just like a dolphin. I was so excited. But as you know, life, that excitement very quickly grew old. I started jumping into all the journals and all the literatures that was available. And I realized, well, yes, I was learning a lot when I figured out how much information there is and I digested all those things. I realized that there's even more that I didn't know. Like, I'll sum up two big problems with the fish. You would think that when it comes to robotic fish, it's really simple. A fish just flaps left and right, left and right, and somehow moves forward. But that's the real problem. How does a fish that wants to move forward do it by moving left and right? Like, look here. If I want to walk, what I do is I put my leg forward and I move forward. If I want to go back, go backwards. Now, like the fish, the fish moves side to side. <laughs> but as you can see, I'm definitely not moving forward. This was really puzzling because it just didn't make sense. Like, there's papers. They they describe that the fish moves forward. It's like, yes, I know the fish, push for, the fish actually moves forward. Now tell me why. And that was something that even after so much research, I could not understand. And add that the additional problem, that I, even if I somehow magically understood everything, that's probably for a PhD, but I have to build the fish. It's an additional layer of difficulty. This here is what I call the dark tunnel of uncertainty. As you can see, on the far left, there is that little shaft that I was falling through. 
I was really learning a lot. I was enjoying myself, and suddenly I hit rock bottom. Thing is, this is the good thing, because most of the ideas, what I realized, I came stumbled upon a point where I now have to face. It's more of like I have a certain footing to go. But the thing is, the ideas became so complex, became so difficult to the point where I couldn't fathom it. I was in this bottom of the cave, and I need to get out. It's dark. No light, obviously, it's in the cave. It's suffocating. And every day I stayed here, I was trapped inside this place. I felt that I was losing myself. Day by day, it wear me down. I took every turn in the cave, and all I, came, I saw was another turn, and another turn. Nowhere was the light that I'm seeking for anywhere closer. Till I realized that I cannot take this anymore. This is not how I want to look at my project. So I realized that I can look at it differently. Rather than see all these problems, all these darkness, so to speak, as enemies, I could look at it in a different light. So rather than seeing darkness as a dark tunnel that you can't get out of, I would like to see it as the vast space in the night sky. If you look up to all the stars, it's beautiful. And instead of looking at all the problems that I have, it's something to solve, something I need to do in order to succeed. I ask myself, why don't I look at it as an adventure? Again, there's so many possibilities. I call this the constellation of possibilities. <laughs> so yeah, that's now. The, these things are really powerful, really. It gave me that spirit to move on. But in a practical terms, I still have to build a fish. So now, given that idea, amazing dreams and whatnot, how do you actually do it? And my solution to that was simple. Think outside the box. Yes, what does that mean? It tells you to be creative, right? But what does that even mean? Let's take our character here. His name's Andrew. Someone told him to be creative, think outside the box, and he asked, what is a box? Well. Now, this is what I think the box is. All the ideas that we have learned, say we learn in school, you learn math, you learn physics, you learn economics, or sometimes when you go home, you, some of you will cook dinner, or some of you go on marathons and runs. All these have their own little boxes. And to that, it's like all this collection of ideas stays in our head. Then the other issue is, well, when you ask me to think outside the box, what happens if like, there's only one box to think from? But the good thing is, that's not how our brain works. Our brain actually has many, many boxes. So I'll explain this with an example. How many of you in the audience have actually taken high school physics? Could you raise your hands? Yeah, awesome, physics nerds. <laughs> the thing is, now, I'm going to ask you a second question. How many of you still remember what the three laws of Newton mo Newtonian motion is? Raise your hands. Yeah. Expect it, not that much. The thing is, you were once an expert in physics or Newtonian motion, but somehow along the ways, it is, you forgot. Has the message truly disappeared? And that's where I say, no, it's somewhere in your head. It's somewhere inside. You just have to really dig deep <laughs> into the ideas. So what I'm saying here is the box that you're currently sitting in, the one that people tell you to sit outside of, it's the things that you're currently engaged in. Whereas you have other boxes somewhere deep inside your head that your brain has archived and put it in a safe place because, let's face it, our brain, can, there's only so many neurons. Now, it gets to the next point. Any uncertain endeavor, something that you do not know the answer, I would say it's a summation of something that is certain and a little bit of creativity. All these boxes that you have in your head, these are those ideas that you can fill up here on your shelf that you could retrieve any moment. When I ask you the question about Newton's law, some of you at the very beginning, you might remember the first or the second and not the third, but I guarantee you if you look a little deeper, just spend a few times, maybe when you're driving on your way home, you would actually remember suddenly out of the flash. Like, how many of you remember it's like when you're arguing with someone and you lost the argument, but only to go home and shower and realize, wait, I could have said that, and then we're destroyed that argument. So yeah, 
that's the thing. So thinking outside the box is basically about first having a whole repository of ideas. And the next question is, you know, how do you actually connect the dots, so to speak? Now, back to the constellation of possibility. If each of these boxes represents a star, then what really truly is a solution or an idea? And I dare say that creativity is simply the connection between all those boxes you have in the, your head. You have as many boxes as you have neurons. And finding the right connection, let's face it, there's probably 10 stars here. And if I were to ask any mathematician how many possible combinations you could graph, that would be a lot. And this is just like a small number. In our head, we have like millions and millions of neurons. So to that, I would say this is the solution. Oh, no, yes, this is intentional. This is a blank piece of paper. What I did when I was stuck at that dark tunnel, which turned into that possibility space, was to write. Every morning when I wake up, I would brush my teeth, you know, wear my clothes, and then go eat breakfast in a cafe shop. Well, I'm a researcher, so I'm not very rich, so I actually go to a cha chan tang. And the strangest thing happened. I wasn't even thinking about the fish. In fact, I was thinking about a mixed martial arts practice I had the day before. I started writing it down, just penning it. And so the whole problem was, I'm a fighter, and I want to deliver the strongest punch possible. My body is kind of small, my arms are not the strongest, but somehow along the ways, I realized that I can punch hard. So what we do normally in MMA is, you don't just punch with your arms. You actually pivot your whole entire body so that you can really get the force out. It's from the power of the hips. And then suddenly it dawned on me, wait, I'm trying to have a force forward, but I'm actually kind of moving sideways. I'm rotating sideways, so to speak. And then, you remember the fish. It moves sideways, but somehow it moves forward. Likewise, in this boxing thing, I'm not going forward, I'm rotating to the side, but somehow I managed to create so much force. And that's when I realized, hey, this makes sense. Everything I've spent, all the journals I've read, the dots just connected. Oh, every single piece made sense. And it all started with this blank piece. Like this slide, this presentation I'm giving you, all the illustrations here started off with a blank canvas. And slowly, I just wrote a stroke after stroke. One stroke leads to another stroke. And then somehow, I managed to produce something, an insight like that. Now, this is the balloon of knowledge. This is what I think it is. So, previously, I mentioned about the box. Every time we learn something or we get a new idea, it's like pumping the balloon. And for the paper, I mentioned that you need a place for your ideas to kind of like connect with each other. And it's like the Brownian motion, if you remember. It's like the balloon is staying a balloon in its shape because of pressure. And inside, there are billions, millions and millions of atoms actually colliding with each other, banging at such high frequencies, trying to make different patterns, and that's what you get is pressure. So the thing is, filled with our certainty, the things that we already know, plus a little creativity about banging all these ideas that's happening here at a million times a second, it will bring us to new heights, so to speak. Well, Supposed to be further, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here, I've been talking about my fish for a very long time, and I would like to show you what I've been working on. As you can see, it's very engineered. There's duct tape and <laughs> lots of ropes and zip ties. I spent a lot of time on this, and compared to where I started, while it's not there as the fastest fish, it's slightly faster than your average swimmer. We just, I just need to push forward to find that stars. And here, 
is the fish in motion. It is really amazing. If you see it closely, it wiggles around side by side and somehow manages to push the water out. And now the thing is, all these might look just like toys. Like it's just a, you know, a research question, nothing practical. But along the way, after working on it for so long, I discovered that there is a, I could help someone with this. Like how my mixed martial arts kind of helped me gain insight from the fish. An insight that I learned from the fish is that perhaps I could apply this to humans to help them. So in, for example, in Paralympics or for rehabilitation wise, because someone who's lost control over their bottom half, it's really difficult to make them walk and it's really dangerous if they fall over. But when it comes to swimming, it's a whole different story because you're floating on the water. And the fact that the fish turns side by side, it's actually really useful because it activates our whole body. And that, to me, it was an amazing discovery, something that I thought was really an engineering project, a, a little interest or curiosity, so to speak, could become something so much more. This is something I never expected when I took the job. Final note, while yes, I've been talking about a story in terms of I, it was never a one-person job. This was the entire team that has helped me out. And finally, I present to you with the last picture, which I hope you remember. When we start on, we embark on a new journey, a new adventure, there will always be difficulties, uncertain points. And especially if you're at the frontiers of something you're doing, there would not be answers. So like this fish journey, I started off knowing nothing. Slowly, I built on the ideas that I already knew, that I learned from school. I read a bit on the works of others. That wasn't enough and I started exploring. Instead of looking at it as all these things I have to do, I need to achieve this, you know, rather than stressing myself out in the despair because day after day, nothing seems to happen. I can look it up like the stars. And when you think of darkness, I want you to really remember the night. On those stormy weathers, remember the night sky. While it is dark, it kind of highlights the beauty of the stars. You can't see the moon during the day. And it's this kind of exploration, this kind of excitement, that energy that will really push you beyond your boundaries. Thank you. <laughs>